So this is uh, the fourth message in a series of sermons where we are in Ezekiel, and this is quite a day for you all to be here uh, because we have been having a conversation about what it means to be in exile, especially with the people of God having gone into exile and been defeated by the Babylonians, and so they are in exile in this strange book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is given then a series of visions, and we are on the fourth vision. We'll be ending this vision uh, walk this next week. I want to thank David Roller for filling in last week. He did a pretty good job, didn't he? Yeah. That's enough. That's, yeah. I already saw him, you know. He's like, you're right, I did, but... Yeah. David did say, though, that I left the good passages. I don't think he said the easy ones for me, but, you know, for these next two weeks. Trust me, Ezekiel 40 through 44 is no cakewalk. We are going to have a little bit of difficult time today as we walk through this, but I know with God's help, He is going to uh, uh, help us. He's going to be with us. Have you ever tried to learn a foreign language? It's not easy, is it? It's not easy to learn a foreign language. In fact, you know that one of the most difficult things about learning any foreign language are the idioms and the metaphors that are part of that culture. You need to understand the culture in order to understand the phrases. So imagine you're trying to learn English as a second or a third language, and you hear someone say, well, he was just shooting the breeze. Like that is natural for us to understand but someone else is going to under, ask, why are Americans so violent, right? <laughs> it's easy as a piece of cake. You're being a Monday morning quarterback, and then we can get into an argument about what is actual football, whether it's American football or soccer, right? It's not easy. You don't understand the culture, so you don't understand the metaphor. Years ago, I was in, I was in Hungary, and... Um, I leaned back against the wall with my knee up, and everybody around me started laughing. All the Hungarians started laughing. And I said, I did something. What was it? And they said, you just asked for a prostitute. <laughs> I said, okay, I did not, <laughs> just to be clear. It's not easy. So I found some English metaphors, though. I'm not even sure that I understand. So here's, here's a couple. So he was busier than a one-armed clown making balloon animals at a kid's party. That'll sink in. She had more problems than a math book. I like that one. Here's my favorite. His two front teeth looked like a couple of chiclets that weren't on speaking terms. So you got to understand what a chiclet is. And I... So language is tricky. So imagine the challenge for us today in trying to understand visions from 2,500 years ago given to Ezekiel. Visions in and of themselves are unique experiences filled with metaphors, and they rely upon an understanding of the metaphors in order for us to understand and receive the same emotional impact as the original hearers. So we need, we need humility we need tenacity, and Holy Spirit, would you help us today? Today, we're going to be in Ezekiel 40 through 44, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge, and not because I'm going to read all those chapters. It's a challenge because what Ezekiel was shown was supposed to motivate the people of Israel to repentance and faithfulness. Only for us, because we don't understand the metaphors, it doesn't have the same emotional and spiritual impact. In Ezekiel 40 through 44, we have the blueprints of a new temple measured the size of the wall, the size of the, the porticos and the entries. We have blueprints. Trust me, as we are reworking our worship center and cafe, as we're in exile in the gym, there hasn't been one time that we have fallen on our faces looking at the blueprints of that building and shouted glory. Like blueprints don't have the same impact for us. But listen to what God told Ezekiel, the impact of the blueprints of a perfect new temple would have on the people of God who were in exile. Ezekiel 43, verse 10. Son of man, 
describe the temple to the people of Israel that they may be ashamed of their sins. Isn't that interesting? Let them consider its perfection. And if they are ashamed of all they have done, make known to them the design of the temple and its arrangements. Tell them about its exits and entrances, its whole design and all its regulations and laws. Write these down before them so that they may be faithful to its design and follow all its regulations. Do you sense the tension between what we understand and what they would have emotionally and spiritually felt? I guarantee you that if I actually read Ezekiel 40 through 44 for us today, in minute detail of the blueprints of the new temple, you wouldn't go, oh, I shouldn't have sinned. <laughs> like, you would, there wouldn't be a motivation to change. I mean, let's make sure to get all our ducks on the same page here. Mixed metaphors are also a hard thing, right, to understand. So this vision of a perfectly designed temple, it may seem strange and maybe even boring in its detail for us, but the Israelites in captivity, they saw in their mind only a ruined temple. Remember that as the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, they took people into exile. So the last thing these people in exile saw was rubble. All of the hopes of God were in rubble around them. And a restored temple complex, it, it, would, it would convict them of their abandonment of the ways of God. Don't you see what you could have had as if the Lord is showing us? But we look around and we just see rubble. And it may be true for you. It may be true that many of you look around and all you see is rubble brokenness, perhaps in your own life, but I think even more in culture, in our nation, and perhaps even in the world. This may be strange for some of you who are younger, but do you know there was actually a day not that long ago when believers in Christ actually believed the world was going to get better? If you ask most young people, is the world going to get better or worse? Most of them will say there's a sense of impending doom, that things are going to get worse. But you literally go back only a hundred some years ago, and if you were asked the average Christian, is the world going to get better or worse, they would say it's going to get better. The promises of God, the kingdom of God is going to sweep this world. People are going to come to know the Lord. They're going to be changed. And God's kingdom, his glory, will bless and fill this world. The last hundred years didn't do us any good. It, it, it caused with the world wars and all the conflicts for many of us to start believing that this is just a, a hellish landscape that we need to escape and wait for heaven. But church, that's not our only hope. Like of all people, I'm preaching, this is side things. Of all people, we need to be people of hope. There are people. There are good days happening. I'm going to challenge some of you to the depths of your core right now in your assumptions, especially for young people here. You need to know that God in his grace and goodness have better days ahead. Some of you don't believe that. Some of you are like, look around. Look at the ruin. That's why we need a vision of what God intends. That's what this chapter is about even in all of its boring blueprint details. Forgive me, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 40, this is how it starts. In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, in the 10th month, in the 14th year after the fall of the city. Those are just words to us. It's 14 years since the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. 25 years they lived in exile. They didn't choose to be born during that time. They didn't, be, they didn't choose to be born during the time when they would, they would be distanced from what seems the hope of God. But on that very day, the hand of the Lord, the eternal one, was on me, and he took me there. Scholars estimate this was about April 28th of 573. And God took Ezekiel in this vision from Babylon or Iraq area 
back to Jerusalem, and in visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel, and he set me on a very high mountain, on, those who, on whose south side were some buildings that looked like a city. He took me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway with a linen cord, which is a measuring item, and a measuring rod in his stand in his hand. And the man said to me, Son of man, look carefully and listen closely. Pay attention to everything I'm going to show you, for that is why you have been brought here. And tell the people of Israel everything you see. So this heavenly man, this vision guide, he then showed Ezekiel from the high mountain perspective a perfectly constructed temple compound with the thickness of the walls and, and the size of the doorways. And in Ezekiel's mind, it, was, it had a beautiful impact. In my mind, I see Ezekiel high on a mountain and looking down over rubble, a city in rubble and ruin or, or exile. It would have reminded Ezekiel of their predicament, but then fading into view, juxtaposed over the top of this rubble and ruin was a new temple just kind of appearing over top of the rubble, a perfect, complete temple, not simply restored, but more beautiful than Ezekiel or the people could have ever imagined. And, and in fact, a vision of the temple more beautiful than Solomon's temple, more beautiful than they could ever have hoped for. And it caused conviction in their heart. What did we do? What, what have we missed? What did we mess up? I want to imagine, you want you to imagine that you have had no food for a week, that like you haven't eaten all week long, and, and in a vision, you're taken to Golden Corral. Now, perhaps any other time, you're like, that's all right, I'll pass, but you haven't eaten all week. And what happens inside of you is like joy that you get to just devour. You, some of you would want to weep. I get to eat. That's the impact of the beautiful temple on Ezekiel and the people. Oh, what have we lost? What have we done? And look, look what we're missing. It reminds me of the promise of Malachi 3.10, when God says that if his people were only faithful, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. That's God's heart, to pour out in your life and in my life. Do not let the present rubble and ruin take away that hope of restoration. God will and can restore but for us, we get lost in the boring words of construction and cubits and, and wall thickness and porticos and rooms. If you read it, Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel 40 through 43, it's, there's, there's palm trees that are supposed to be painted and inlaid and, and cherubim with lion and human faces on the walls and gates and doors. It's just, it's just almost endless, these four chapters. But for them, in exile... It was God laying out a smorgasbord of his goodness and presence represented in this picture of a new temple. I'm going to meet you there. And there's hope. And then to top it all of that, in Ezekiel 43, Ezekiel sees God's glory come back to the temple. Where he left, he comes back. Then a man brought me to the gate facing east, and I saw the glory of the God of Israel coming from the east. His voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. This word land is actually the word earth. And the earth was radiant with the glory of God. Do you see it? Do you hope for it? This vision I saw was like the vision I had seen when he came to destroy the city and like the visions I had seen by the Kabar River and I fell face down. It was too much glory. 
glory of the Lord entered the temple through the gate facing east. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple, the weight of God. There have been times in my life when I knew God was there. So there's a general sense that we know God is there. We know he's present. But have you ever had those moments when you just know the holy is there? When what is called the I-thou or the we-thou experience happens, when something, it's almost like time freezes and the presence of God enters the church building, the hospital room, your room, the presence and glory of God. It is, it's so overwhelming for us that, quite honestly, the Lord at times has to pull back because in our present physical state, we don't have the full capability yet that we will have one day to experience the fullness of God. And there will be a day when we get to experience the full weight and the glory of God. Now, it just seems as we get glimpses here and there. And I just want to say to you, there's no pattern. The weight and the glory that someone else experiences isn't the one that you have to wait for. There's not a, a pattern. And it, it seems as if, to me, the Lord shows up for each of us how he's designed us. And some of you are like, woo-woo people, Right? Like the glory of the Lord seems all around you. Some of us are like, what's wrong with those people? <laughs> and for you, it may be more what the monks call the burning heart of silence, where you sit in stillness, but your heart burns. And you may not be dancing. You let those people dance, but your heart's burning. Please don't let anybody else's experience of the glory of God somehow make you feel as if there's less of what you can experience. Does that make sense? That's a side note. In these visions, Ezekiel hears God's voice coming from the Holy of Holies and promising that his people would be given clear hearts to follow him and that they would put aside their idols. Look at these verses. While the man was standing beside me, I heard someone speaking to me from inside the temple. And he said, Son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place for the soles of my feet. This is where I live among the Israelites forever. The people of Israel will never again defile my holy name. Neither they nor their kings by their prostitution and the funeral offerings for their kings at their death. That was a way of deifying the kings and making these dead kings into gods. When they place their threshold next to my threshold and their doorpost beside my doorposts with only a wall between me and them, in other words, I could hear their idolatry. That's how close it was to me. They defiled my holy name by their detestable practices, so I destroyed them in my anger. His wrath was used to bring them back. Now let them put away from me their prostitution and the funeral offerings for their kings, and I will live among them forever. And then from chapters 44 through 48, which is the end of Ezekiel, we have further restoration promised, the restoration of the priesthood. And it ends then with the river flowing from the temple in chapter 47. We're going to be there next week. It's going to be a good week. Wherever the river flows, there is life. God's good promises. And then the end of the book says this, the name of the city from that time on will be the Lord is there. The Lord is present. It's, it's tough, but you can get it. An exiled people being shown that God still has good plans for them. Amen. Through a vision of a perfect temple and the promise of his presence. Folks, this is a hint at Emmanuel, God with us. And I'd love to end there, that there's this hope in your ruined rubble lives for, for what God's going to do. But there's some tension in this chapter that I need to address. And if I were smarter, I wouldn't talk about this. <laughs> but I'm new, and I don't know whose toes I'm stepping on yet. So it's good. You don't know that I'm preaching right at you. The temple, here's the tension. This perfect temple 
that Ezekiel was shown to the people in exile, it's never been built. Even though we have the blueprints of the temple, size, width, description, it's never been built. A temple was built. Ezra and Nehemiah, they rebuilt the temple. The people of God came back. Herod, later on, added on to that temple. That was then the temple that Jesus went to and was presented to when the disciples later said, look how beautiful this temple is. You remember what Jesus said? It's coming down. And in 70 AD, that temple was destroyed. But this temple has never been built to these exact measurements. In fact, in this chapter, there's more of a sense that God will build this rather than a command to Ezekiel, so go build this. He doesn't say, as he said to Moses, go build this. In fact, it was never built. So this has caused, hang with me, we're going to go deep, all kinds of speculation. <laughs> more than you can shake a stick at. And figuring out what is speculation and what is biblical truth, it's more difficult than trying to put socks on a rooster. <laughs> They're going to keep coming, folks. So. so if God promised a temple to be built in Israel to Ezekiel, and it didn't happen, or hasn't happened, one of three things could be true. One, it's going to happen one day, that there will be a temple rebuilt, a physical temple. Two, it has happened only in a spiritual metaphor that is the church and the New Testament. Or three, it's a picture of the heavenly temple represented in Christ. Now, those are your choices if you're going to be biblically faithful. And each one of them has a real-world impact. It's not just theologizing just for the sake of theologizing. It has a real-world impact. There are people, and it could be you, who believe that there will be an actual temple built in Israel one day to these specifications. It's called the third temple movement. You can see this potential third temple, some people do, as a sign of the end of the times. Like as soon as that temple's built, Christ is coming back or the millennium started. There are Christians and Jews in Israel particularly who are actively promoting the building of a third temple to these specifications. Just Google it, and you will go down the rabbit hole of end-time speculation. For there are bank accounts set up you can give to, to rebuild this temple. And they're more than happy to take your money. And you will get on a list I'm going to be careful because you're going to find out what I believe. But they, you just get on a list where they just keep sending you stuff. Right? So don't put my address on there. There's a few challenges with this view, that there's an actual temple that's going to be built in Jerusalem or in the surrounding area. One, if this temple is going to be built on the current temple mount in Jerusalem, the world's oldest surviving Islamic mosque and the third holiest site in Islam is standing in the way. And you can personally draw out the implications globally if a bunch of Christians and Jews agree to destroy the third most holy spot in Islam. You can imagine, can't you, what would happen and for some people, it's almost as if they are chomping at the bit to see this happen. And it's often people who have never experienced war. My understanding of the scriptures and violence is that God's people are to be people of peace, not violence. And even for those of us who believe that there is just war theory 
just war only acts in response and to a certain level, not tit for tat. So you have a problem if you're going to celebrate death in order to see this temple built. Secondly, the size of Ezekiel's temple, it's too big for the Temple Mount. It's too big, and we have specific sizes. It's way too big for the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, which means it would have to be built near the Dead Sea. That's the only area that's possible. And then Jerusalem would be abandoned as the center and capital of Israel. And so there's theological issues all around just with this issue. When I was in Israel a few a year or two ago, our guide was a secular Jew who fought in the 68 war that was getting ready to take the Temple Mount. He has an opinion as to whether or not they should have been allowed to destroy it. But that day, we were actually given the option of going up on top of the Temple Mount to see the, mo- the, the Dome of the Rock and the mosque up there. Or we could go visit Hezekiah's tunnels. And our guide had already purchased tickets for Hezekiah's tunnel, so he had an opinion. He didn't want to go up on top of Temple Mount. Jewish people generally don't go up there. One of the reasons they don't go up there is because that's where the temple stood, and they are worried that they would step on the Holy of Holies. And so there's warnings, actually. Signs as you go up there. Be careful where you walk so you you may be stepping on the Holy of Holies. There's all kinds of issues wrapped up in whether this would be on the Temple Mount or further south. But thirdly, and I think this is the most difficult challenge, if we are going to believe that somehow a temple in Jerusalem should be something we should spend our money on. Ezekiel 43 talks about the restoration of the sacrificial system. Ezekiel 43 says, after the temple's built, goats and lambs will be sacrificed again. For Christians, this is a problem. For Christians who hope in an actual restored temple in Israel as a sign of Christ's return, and even more specifically for some, the inauguration of the millennial reign of Christ, you've got a problem. If you believe that God is still going to one day demand a return to sacrificing animals, you have a problem. Hebrews 10.4 tells us it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Christ fulfilled all of this. So Hebrews 10.10, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Once and for all. So perhaps this is the most poignant thing I'm going to say, so give me some grace. If there's another temple built one day and it's forced by our political and financial effort from here in the U.S. and sacrifices return, it's more like an abomination than it is an act of faithfulness. For Jesus paid the price of his life to fulfill this whole system. It can't be, in my opinion, What was shown to Ezekiel? My concern is this. The people who fanatically believe this, they may force it to happen. God could actually let it happen. Herod was never told to build onto the temple, but he did. And there are people that would give money to cause war and pain and then say, we're doing it in the name of God. I just can't see that being the heart of God. If a temple's going to be built, let God do it, in my opinion. Maybe it'll be a sign, but you're not in charge of pushing the signs. You're not. Ezekiel's temple, then, in my opinion, that he saw is either a spiritual metaphor for the New Testament and for Christ or his a picture of the perfectly heavenly temple that Jesus entered into 
after he was raised from the dead. I, I lean towards this interpretation, and I could be wrong, because of verses in Hebrews and verses in Revelation. Are you still with me? Like, that's, that's deep, right? That's like weeks of Googling deep that you are going to, some of you are like, oh, I'm there now all like the next couple of weeks. This is what you're going to be doing. In Hebrews chapter 9, let me make a case for why I believe that there isn't an actual physical temple that's going to be built. In Hebrews 9, we are told that earthly temples and sacrifices, they were only images, types of the true heavenly temple. Kind of like a wall switch. You know, if you flip a wall switch and, and it controls a light in another room, the temple here where sacrifices happen, it was the light switch for what happened in heaven or vice versa. What happened there was the light switch here. So that when Christ died here, Scripture can say he was crucified from the foundation of the world. His death here was representative of the sacrificial giving of the Son of God for all time. Hebrews 9 says this, it was necessary for the copies of heavenly things to be purified by these rites, by the blood of animals. But the heavenly things themselves, they need to be purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, Christ entered he heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the ages, we're in a new age, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as is appointed for man once to die, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Those are powerful words. I'm only two pages away, but that could last all day. Trust me, we're, we're landing the plane soon. The earthly temple was just a copy. It wasn't the real deal. Brick and mortar, animal sacrifice could never take away the real sins of people. They were only to be a light switch or a picture of what God himself did for us, the sacrifice of his son. And then John, the great exiled one himself, in the book of Revelation, he sees this vision that sounds like the language of the temple in Ezekiel 40. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life. We're going to talk about this next week. Bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, and through the middle of the street of the city, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and the night will be no more, and there'll be no light or lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever and ever. And do you hear Handel? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. There's a vision you and I need of something greater coming to keep going in this world. It's not all bad news. In fact, it's the best news. The kingdom of God is coming. And Ezekiel got a glimpse of this, and he fell on his face. And he said, go tell people that there are greater things yet to come, beautiful things, promises of perfection and joy, and this longing that wells up inside of us when we look at this world and say, it's a mess. Scripture says, you bet it is, but it's not all there is. There's going to be a day when the curse is taken care of. And the beauty of God is going to be from heaven to earth. You can't even imagine. We're not going to sing that song, but you can't even imagine. C.S. Lewis said, if we got a glimpse of what you and I are going to be like when Christ returns, we would be tempted to worship each other. There's only one worthy of worship, but there's good days ahead, folks. God has great plans. 
And in the meanwhile, he calls us to growth and to be holy and to trust in him and to not let the darkness and the despair that everyone else is talking about, don't let it enter the church. Don't let it enter our hearts, for there's hope. There's a plan, and God will restore all things. I, I ask that we would sing this final song. And this final song is really a responsive song. It, it's taken from the book of Revelation, where the Ancient of Days, the, the Holy One, John sees him. And remember, he's in exile. He's been dipped in burning oil. He has the scars of Christ on him because of the physical pains he's suffering in this world. But he was joyful, folks. And he sees a vision, the Ancient of Days, and God holds his hand out, and there's a scroll on it. And that scroll is written in the front side and the back side, and it's all the plans of the unfolding future God's going to bring. And a question is asked, is there anyone worthy to open that scroll? And John looks around. He looks in hell. He looks in heaven. He looks on earth. He says, nobody, nobody was found who is worthy to open the scroll and the plans of God and see it come to fruition. It says John wept. That's where we are. Nobody can plan your way out. There aren't programs that can fix things in your life. Some of them can be helpful, but fo folks, John looked and there was the lamb as if it had been slain, who was worthy to open up the scroll and to read it, and then all of this stuff starts happening. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Would you give yourself to the Lord as we sing this song? Would you stand as we sing, Is He Worthy?